Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in. This podcast is right for you if you don't want to be average, but rather want to look great, feel great and perform. All of the advice that you will hear in this podcast is delivered to you by my expert guests and by me, a holistic nutrition coach. In this episode, Anastasia Zinchenko, PhD, joined me to discuss protein. Well, Anastasia is a scientist who specializes in protein, so she is the perfect fit for this topic. And I'm very grateful that she found time for us to share her knowledge. But what is more important, Anastasia walks her talk. She is a powerlifter and she built all her muscle and get all her strength on a vegan diet. So in this episode, we dive into Anastasia's background, how she became vegetarian and a vegan, and how she became a scientist and why she chose the field of protein specifically. We quickly mention our thoughts on the ideal diet and what we think is wrong with how people relate to food nowadays. We discuss differences in plant and animal sources of protein and Anastasia gives her vegan specific protein requirement recommendations for vegans or anybody who wants to source their protein from plants, plant-based proteins. We cannot omit some myths about protein, there are a lot of them. Anastasia also explains why we should not be afraid of processed foods such as TVP or texturized vegetable protein, usually sourced from soy or seitan, and how to use it in your diet as a supplement. Then she answers your questions, specifically why you might look soft while trying to build muscle, and why muscle soreness is not the thing to aim for in your training sessions. As always guys, you can find all the important links in the show notes, so be sure to check them out. And if you like this podcast, please share it with your friends, rate it, like it, follow it, follow me, or subscribe to me, as it helps to bring interesting topics and expert guests to the podcast. If you have any questions, please let me know, and you can do that by going to my website, which is www.com danweiss.eu that is www.danweiss.eu and you can post your questions there through con- contact page without further ado let's dive into the, our discussion hello and welcome everybody thank you for listening and for tuning in today Today I'm speaking with a protein researcher, Anastasia, who is also uh, a lifter. She's a vegan athlete. And well, Anastasia, for those people who don't know you, how would you sum up yourself briefly? Hello, everyone. Um, Well, that's a good question how I would sum up myself. I am a scientist with a background in chemistry, biochemistry. And after I have completed my PhD in biochemistry in, at the University of Cambridge, I transitioned to what I became more passionate about, which was strength sports and sports performance nutrition. Because while I was doing my PhD, I started lifting. I started doing bodybuilding and powerlifting. I was the pizza bench press uh, champion in the UK and represented Great Britain at the World Championship. And during my PhD, I already started uh, doing admin work in many Facebook communities that were vegan and about vegan bodybuilding and strength sports. And then I decided to change my field of research. Then I worked for basic bodybuilding, what is now Mental uh, Mental Handleman's um, Academy, and uh, we have run really cool research on protein requirements for strength athletes, what how much they need to eat to recover, if more protein is better, how much protein do you need as a strength athlete when you diet to stay full, because that's kind of a big problem for many weight class athletes or strength athletes that they need to diet for competitions but still they shouldn't lose any muscle and they shouldn't lose their performance because if you diet for a competition as a power lifter but then lose all your strength then you aren't competitive enough anymore 
So I have done it for a while. Also, over all the time in parallel, I have done online coaching, uh, mostly vegans, also vegan strength athletes. And uh, now I recently brought my food product on the market. I'm really excited about it. It's a vegan high protein pancake and waffle mixture. I have formulated based on scientific research and based on my experience as strength athlete and coach, and also as a scientist, as a chemist, because you don't want to eat something that isn't really tasty. That's like a really amazing meal, high in protein. That gives you all what you need. So now also one of my major focuses is also on this part, on the, on this product and to share it with as many people as possible so that they can gain strength, lose weight and um, also, you know, do the least harm possible as a vegan because often it's also not just important to think about yourself, but also about the others and the environment. Yeah, so that's what I'm yeah, actually. At the moment. I don't know if you have noticed now that you were mentioning like environment and so on, and uh, these other things regarding the protein that there has been some proposal from uh, from some scientists to reclassify like protein and uh, the way how they want to reclassify it is like not based only on uh, bioavailability but also like. Uh, on the impact on environment and so on. So protein quality would uh, cons or protein quality rating would consist of like uh, how effective it is, you know, how fast it absorbs, like what is the amino acid composition, but also its impact on environment. So this could be. Yeah. Yeah. The impact on the environment is really important because the way how we live now, I'm not really sure how long we can sustain it. And plant protein, they, it requires less resources and less energy to the environment. That's why, you know, I think it's a like, great way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So how long have you been actually vegan for and what made you uh, to enter this lifestyle? That's a good question. I can't, I need to count back. I think now I was vegan for about six to seven years, probably six and a half years. I have been for 12 years vegetarian before. And what made me switch? Um, for us, it was probably the health aspect. I was curious about it, if I will feel better. And uh, then I was actually, when I started eating plant-based, I looked more into the environmental uh, impact mm -hmm. of um, non-vegan foods and also like you know, all these ethical issues because as i mentioned i was vegetarian for 12 years before and i was like you know didn't really want to look into it because i was like okay I, you know I, i'm one of the good people i don't eat any meat anymore so you know i, I do everything that is good but then when i realized that all the dairy industry and egg industry uh, that they aren't innocent at all then it became for me also like uh you know really a moral issue where it was like okay i don't want to support their industry mm -hmm. and egg industry as well so, so for for now it's definitely the ethical argument i i just want to do the least harm possible often it's not possible to be perfect because uh, you can't just buy your i don't know food from local farmers or grow everything yourself but when I do decisions on a daily basis what to buy, I just try to do the least harm possible. And being vegan is definitely a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And what actually made you switch to vegetarian diet then? Um, it's a really good question because I was a teenager back then. And since I was a child, I always wanted to be vegetarian. But I didn't <laughs> have a reason to tell to my mother. It's like, oh, you know, I, I'm going to stop eating meat. So I think for me as a child it was already like an ethical argument which I didn't understand at that point because my grandparents had, had they had animals and I've seen how you know the animals have been slaughtered. So and I really, really disliked it as a child. So I think it was kind of influenced still from that time, but it wasn't really clear to me. And when there was this BSE crisis, this med cow disease. Uh, then I had the reason to tell, okay, I'm going to stop eating meat. And then it was like, oh, okay, yeah, she's a teenager, it will go by. And well, it never went by. 
Yeah, because um, the part why I'm asking is that there are some people who... You are from Finland, right? Uh, no, I'm originally from Ukraine. Ah, Ukraine, okay. So, anyway, uh, the point is that, like, you are very close to me, or your origin is very close to me. Yeah. And, uh, like, in our, let's say, culture, or, uh, like, our ancestors ate also meat, I would say pretty heavily also Ukrainian dishes are, pre- if I'm not mistaken, pretty heavy on meat, right? Yeah. But also kasha and... <laughs> yeah, kasha, kasha is actually a grain. Kasha is like bhakti. So, yes, you know, it's, I love it. It's a little bit grain. <laughs> it's actually it's my favorite <laughs> grain. I'm not a big fan of grains, but if I eat something, I eat uh-huh. bhakti. It's just done half an hour ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah which, which is also gluten-free, right? <laughs> So, uh, some people could argue, like, uh, the, uh, the vegan diet is not the right for us, because, you know, like, in India, people have been, like, vegetarian mostly for a very long time, but we here, we were, I would say, like, uh, eating domesticated animals and uh, eat hunting, maybe, like, deer, rabbits, and some other animals throughout the year. You know, the question is, what is right for us in which period of time or the world we live in? You know, Mm -hmm. if uh, our ancestors, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands years ago, couldn't survive without eating meat or hunting, that was what was necessary for their survival. However, for us in the, let's say, Western society now, it's not really necessary to eat meat to survive. And actually, eating meat does more harm than good. Also, if you just consider the environmental sector, as an example, you know, it's just one of them. Um, For this reason, uh, you know, you have to consider everything in a context. And, you know, it's a larger picture. If there's, let's say, a tribe somewhere in, uh, I don't know, in Africa, or maybe somewhere in some kind of rainforest, and they have just, poisonous plants around them or no plants and meat is their only food source they how can they can survive. It's something completely different. They live in a completely different environment. But for the environment we live in, meat is not really necessary. And there is now also the food industry or in food science. Uh we can have lots of or uh, high protein vegan food. So there's of course, as a vegan, you have to pay attention to what you eat, that you get your proteins, that you get your nutrients, that you supplement with B12, and so on and so on and so on. But it's possible, and uh, it's better for many, you know, viewpoints than eating meat. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you mentioned that, that, that uh, before, I mean, what we did before, it doesn't mean that it was ideal and it was a different state and age and uh, people had completely different problems back then than we have right now so yes. we are facing a completely also, different issues you know also another thing that is important to consider our ancestors even if it's i don't know our grandparents or grand grandparents they didn't have meat every day most of the time mm-hmm. at least if they were like probably super rich but like normal people um and now meat is available in all the supermarkets and children don't even know where meat comes from. They think, oh, they don't associate it with animals oftentimes. They think, oh, that's just the stuff you can get in the supermarket. So, no, you know, the newer generation doesn't see that actually it's, it, it was an animal. It was a living being. And then how much work you have to put in to grow up an animal. And uh, right. that was something that generations before have seen because it wasn't like uh, I don't know they had I don't know hundred cows at home. It was like they had maybe one or two, and it was something like really available. And even if they had to kill it, it was in a completely different uh, context. You know, it was still you know they appreciated what they had. They knew how much work it uh, has to you know has to go in, and also consider it as a living living being because they took care of this animal for, I don't know, months or years and also have built a connection to this animal. So what yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm, yeah, what, what, what I'm kind of um, 
what I disagree the most is that uh, what you see now, the people don't really value like the the life or like the value of the animal and the living beings and don't see mm-hmm. w- what it actually is. They see it just as a product. Yeah, I'm very happy that you brought this point here as like we grew very disassociated from the food because we can come to a supermarket and I mean, we just see some packaged food basically. And it's not only about animals, but I see it also, it's like about plants or whatever. Basically, we don't grow it, we don't appreciate it. And once, for example, in my case, as I started cooking more, I started growing some plants. Okay, I'm not self-sustained when it comes to plants, but uh, I mean, we still have garden at home, so we grow like tomatoes and so on. First, homegrown, it tastes so much better. It has much better nutritional profile, I would argue. And it helped me to reconnect with the, I would say, environment. You know, like, uh, or with the food especially. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very glad. Definitely. Also, like, if you look at many, uh, I don't know, let's say tomatoes that are grown somewhere in glass houses, they aren't even grown in soil. They are grown in some kind of wool, just, you know, filled with water. And uh, what nutrient profile can you expect from it? You can just get out what you put in. Of course. Uh, I would say that this can be solved, right? Because there are some water solutions with uh, vitamins, minerals, and so on. Of course, it might not be ideal, but uh, I would say it's pretty good. Still, I advocate for eating foods that are locally produced and in season. Yeah, and um, this is one thing. Also, like, uh, really eat seasonal, seasonal and also local if possible. That's something that is really stressed in the UK and I really learned in the UK, I have to be honest, because the people there, they paid really attention to eating like local produce that isn't shipped from, I don't know, Africa or South America or somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And that's also something I try to pay attention to. And in the UK, it's definitely easier to do it than, uh, let's say, even in Germany. And okay. uh, yeah, and also like... You know, what we also have now is lots of things with, um, like, eating disorders or, like, uh, overeating and uh, obesity epidemic and all the emotional issues because I work a lot um, in this field as well and also I have a book on eating behavior and food obsession. You know, if everyone would grow the food or prepare the food themselves, it wouldn't be the same because now we can go to the supermarket, get lots of cookies and chocolate and cake and go on a binge uh, just to escape from the, you know, from the world, from the life, from the stress, just to get comfort. However, if you have to bake your cookies or bake a cake before, then you think twice if you want to go like on a massive cookie binge. Yeah, that's a great topic I'm very interested in right now or in past few weeks. But let's get to the actually protein debate. That's why we are here. Uh, not that I don't enjoy our conversation so mm-hmm. far. <laughs> so what actually uh, made you interested in protein research specifically? Um, I think it was the fact that there were actually no real recommendations for vegans or no real research studies on vegans. There's a few research studies that examine vegan protein, but the subjects in those research studies weren't vegan as far as I know. And for me as a strength athlete, when I became vegan, I actually started lifting at the same time. So if people say, oh, you can't grow muscle on a vegan diet, you have grown your muscle with meat and then you became vegan, for me it's totally not the case because I started strength training and became vegan exactly at the same time. And That's great. For me, it was also interesting, okay, um, yeah, what should I eat to grow muscle? You know, where do I get my protein from? Where, you know, because then I saw all the recommendations for meat eaters and I was like, okay, I'm not eating meat. Is this somehow different for me? And mm-hmm. so then I started reading the research papers also from different fields, also about protein and trying to 
combine all the research to develop some guidelines for vegans. So what is the actual difference in animal sources of protein and uh, plant-based sources? Well, the thing is, what we really need is not just protein, but the amino acids. Amino acids are components of protein. Protein is like a chain or a house, and the amino acids are the single bricks or the elements you need to build a house. And there are essential amino acids and not essential. The not essential are the ones our bodies can produce themselves. And the essentials are the ones we need to get from food. And plant protein has fewer essential amino acids than animal protein. So that's the first thing. Okay, if you're a vegan, you need to eat more protein to get more of the right bricks for your muscle health. Let's say it like that. Mm-hmm. And then it's not just enough to get enough essential amino acids because there are different ones. It's like if you build a house, you have bricks, you have windows, you have doors. So if you get uh, lots of doors but no windows, you can't build a functional house. <laughs> you know, and that's the same. You need to pay attention that you get enough of all the essential amino acids you need. Uh, I have, you know, looked into research. I've done lots of calculations, thought about it, you know, for some time. And for this reason, um, it's important if you are vegan and want to build muscle, you need to get protein from different sources. Because, for example, grain protein has more of sulfur-containing amino acids. Other protein, vegan protein sources are lower in. Uh, legumes have more of uh, lysine. Other, like, vegan protein sources are low in. So basically, you just need to combine different vegan protein sources to get all the brick doors, uh, windows you need to build your muscle. Right, and this actually, I think, comes into one of the myths that is in vegan community, and I know that it has been said many times, but I think it will not hurt to repeat it. And that is like, how much protein do we actually need? Because there are, I see many... Uh, many people in vegan communities they argue like ah we only need like 0.8 you know they are shooting at the lowest possible amount as if they were scared that uh, eating more than that minimum amount which they don't consider to be like the minimum is like hurt um, can hurt us or make us sick or produce cancer or you know, basically just have some health risks. Um, yeah, there are lots of myths and I've addressed them a lot in the past. Um, basically, it's not true. If you want to have a long version, I can talk about it forever, but I'm not sure how your audience is, uh, you know, interested. Yeah, like, in let's, just make, uh, let's, uh, let's just put it in a, a short context. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just okay. uh, make, make like short, uh, short short version. Context. Okay, let's let's cover. Okay, kidneys. It's not true that were studies that were run on animals. It's not not true for humans. Um, someone who has a kidney disease should be careful with protein intake. That's true. But for healthy kidneys, uh, there are no you know no risks. And um, there was actually one factor. Um, GFR that is used to measure kidney function and blood tests and so on. And when you eat an, uh, a lot of protein, it increases and people thought, oh, okay, that's bad that this factor increases. But also pregnant women, you see in pregnant women that the same thing increases as well. And pregnancy is not a risk factor for kidney disease. So it's just an adaptation to, to different conditions, to changing conditions in the body. So that's much to the kidney thing. So you can have, you know, eat enough protein, a lot of protein. It's not bad for your kidneys if you aren't predisposed to kidney disease or you don't have a kidney disease. Um, Then another thing is with calcium, that protein pulls out calcium from the bones. There are are lots of different studies. Some some have shown, oh, if you eat more protein, you excrete more calcium. Um, Then um, the past years, uh, it has been actually shown that if you eat enough protein, you also absorb more calcium. That's why you excrete also more. So your body needs just a certain amount of calcium 
to have enough. And if there's more than needed, uh, you pee out more more calcium. And because if you eat protein, you also get more calcium, you can also pee out more calcium. So that's the thing with uh, bones. And actually, protein is really required for also healthy bones. So it's also not an issue. What other myths? Oh, cancer myths. Um, yeah, IG, IGF-1. Uh, yeah. So IGF-1, the interesting thing about IGF-1 is that uh, high IGF-1 levels were actually associated also like with cancer and everything. But what many people don't know that low IGF-1 levels were actually associated with more heart diseases. So it's not really good that your IGF-1 is too low. Uh, you know, it's about balance. It's about the healthy balance in the human body. There is a certain range that is healthy. And also for... So not enough protein is also not good, as I mentioned, because of the heart disease risk. And um, regarding cancer, it is also important to know that cancer is not just something that emerges. Uh, you need a, a kind of a thing that causes cancer and then a second thing that promotes cancer, that makes the cancer grow. The protein definitely doesn't cause cancer. So if someone, like in many animal studies, uh, there were animals that were being taken and there were like really toxic substances applied to them or uh, there were cancer cells implanted into those animals. And maybe for certain cancer types, if you eat uh, lots of protein, especially that contains, if I remember correctly, sulfur containing amino acids, it can make certain cancer types grow. But again, it depends on the cancer type. And I'm by far not the cancer expert to speak about it. Um, I just, or well, what precise cancer types these are, but as, far, as much as I know, there are like different cancer types. Maybe mm -hmm. for certain cancer types, right. it can make sense to reduce the intake of certain amino acids, but not for other cancer types. But again, if someone has cancer, then uh, it's a completely different issue. The person should, you know, speak to a doctor, speak to someone who is really, um, you know, expert in this area. But the thing is, protein doesn't cause cancer. But if somebody already has cancer and a certain cancer type, then uh, one should be maybe careful with certain amino acids. Yeah, basically what I know, I'm not an expert, of course, on cancer, but uh, when you are already diagnosed with the cancer, basically we need proteins also to... Uh, build our immune system which is very hindered through uh, because of the treatment of the cancer of course usually of course. so so you need to yeah. so you, in the end you need protein to build uh, your immunity or strengthen it another thing is that cancer patients uh, typically have lost or lose their appetite and therefore they don't get enough protein so that they even might need to supplement with it, you know, through all these drinks and different formulations. And what else? I mean, yeah. this yeah, is right. based, and usually also who is the typical cancer patient? It's like older people who have also lower absorption or ability to, yes, to absorb the proteins. So this is another thing. Yeah, so that's, the, the, that's it's that's much that's more, it's much more complicated than most people make it. Yeah. What applies for diseased people, people with certain disease, doesn't apply for healthy individuals. And uh, of course, protein exactly. is not only needed to build muscle, because many people think you just need protein, you know, to become this really huge guy in the gym. But it's not true, because, you know, proteins are like, uh, our bodies have enzymes. Enzymes are also proteins. There are so many different tissues and everything that are built of proteins or different molecules or even uh, like neurotransmitters and hormones that they are also built out of amino acids or modified amino acids. Uh, like the entire body functions based on proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th this is something that definitely most people don't consider or don't think about like uh, definitely there is this association like protein means muscle yeah also especially for say. elderly people who you know definitely don't have as a goal to become a bodybuilder 
Uh, for them, protein is very important because uh, muscle tissue, muscle mass declines with age. And uh, the lower muscle tissue or lean body mass, as you call it, was actually associated with mortality. So people who lose more muscle with age um, are more likely to die earlier. And that's why it's really important also for elderly people to get enough protein and also to resistant strain. And hereby, I don't suggest that, you know, every granny becomes a power lifter, not at all. But uh, for, also for elderly people, the exercise programs differ from exercise programs for young people, but they definitely should use their muscle. Yeah, definitely. Stay active for as, as long as you yeah. can. Yeah, so what, what is actually, uh, what is the amount of protein we should actually shoot for? And let's speak about like, especially athletic populations. Okay, athletic. Because I know based, based, based on the podcast that I have listened to also with you, uh, you have, I think, a little bit of higher standard for the proteins specifically for vegan people. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, because of the reasons I mentioned before, you can need more protein. Usually the recommendation I work with is 2.4 grams per kilogram body weight for a vegan strength athlete. Uh, for vegan sedentary person or vegan endurance athlete, it's less. But let's say this vegan strength athlete is 2.4. Sometimes um, for people who diet and can't, don't have too many calories, I suggest 2.1 grams and supplementing with uh, lysine. Mm-hmm. Um, then, yeah, but also often people, in, when, when you speak about digestion, people who get lots of raw food in, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, raw vegan diet at all. I'm pretty much against the raw vegan diet, but let's say some people get also lots of whole foods and plants that are raw, then all the fiber and anti-nutrients may become issues because they can inhibit protein digesting enzymes, but these people would even need like 2.7 grams uh, of protein per kilogram body weight. Yeah, and that's a huge amount (laughs) coming from the raw diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, in such cases, a protein powder supplementation definitely makes sense because uh, you don't want to eat Mm -hmm. 10 kilograms of broccoli a day. (laughs) Yeah, that would be... Disasters, yeah. I would say. So, what are actually problems that people that you experience um, that they face? Like, for example, I know that there are a lot of people who want to have like all the protein covered from maybe uh, from just whole foods, like you mentioned, from the raw food because they follow the raw food diet or this lifestyle. Um, people who are opposing or are completely against, you know, protein powders or uh, highly processed protein uh, powders or uh, like soy isolate, uh, texturized vegetable protein or seitan. So what is actually your take on these troubles, not really troubles, but on these cases? No. The first question that comes to my mind is why? Why do you want to make it more difficult than it is? And, um, you know, for myself, I often distinguish between positive processing and negative processing. And this can be also in the context of the single individual and your goals and your needs and so on. So negative processing is like what we often hear in media or read. uh, It's like, oh, it's processed food, it's bad. Like negative processing would be, for example, sugar. So, you know, sugar comes from a plant. So you remove all the good things like fiber to isolate what is less good, like sugar. Also, I don't say that sugar is the devil, but uh, in general, there are kind of more or less protective mechanisms uh, in nature that you can't get too much sugar. Of course, you some crazy raw vegans totally overdo it and eat 50 bananas a day, but let's say it's not, not the case <laughs> for a normal person who has common sense. But if you eat like whatever, a banana or apple, or I don't know, you eat one apple, maybe you can eat two apples. I really like love pears 
so I can eat lots of them, but maybe I eat like two or three, but then it's enough. I wouldn't eat more. And if I take the amount of sugar that is inside and just recalculate it to, I don't know, cookies or whatever sugary drink, it's much easier to get much more sugar in uh, that is like more concentrated there without any effort. So this case, it's like for me, negative processing. You take out sugar out of the plant and bring it in an unhealthy context. Uh, positive processing is for me like protein powder or even like whatever fiber supplement. You take something that is beneficial and make it easier to reach specific goals, like hitting your protein intake. And uh, for this reason, I don't see any concerns with uh, using kind of positively processed food like protein powder uh, if you still get enough, uh, you know, healthy stuff in your diet, enough fruits, enough vegetables, enough fiber, enough minerals, nutrients, and so on. Uh, it's not, if someone would just eat protein powder and nothing else, then I would say, uh, guy, you know, you're, you're crazy, get your veggies in. That's also not good either. But supplementing with protein powder or eating what I often do, I have like a really big veggie-based meal and I use protein powder to make protein bread or uh, use vital wheat gluten protein powder to make a protein sausage. Like not sausage because I like meat, but just because it's convenient to make and taste good. Then uh, it's, it's a completely different story. Uh, in my opinion, the most important thing for a healthy diet is having enough vegetables. And like vegetables that are green, nutrient rich, not necessarily like, I don't know, potatoes or french fries. That's, you know, isn't, it's also veggie based, but it's not a healthy diet. Oh, why is that? Well, uh, should I really explain why, it? Why, why not potatoes or maybe rice? Well, potatoes are actually great because they're really satiating. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if you just. Yeah, for real. Yeah, but if. It, yeah, if, if you have like boiled potatoes, they're really satiating. Uh, but the French fries combined with all the fat, it's definitely not the case. And also like heat processing at high temperatures, like uh, vegetable uh, crisp chips and stuff. That's again the thing um, that can be, you know, it was discussed that it may contain some molecules that can actually cause cancer. But it doesn't apply to heat processing uh, like that is not dry, but uh, with water, like cooking potatoes. Yeah, so basically it's again like a question of processing, whether it's like negative, positive, yeah, it was exactly. not, nothing specific against potatoes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also many things people are also like concerned about, like uh, textured meats and so on. Uh, especially, I heard it, especially with um, textured soy protein. Uh, that um, they are like solvents and the solvent extractions. Um, the residues of solvents, when I checked it, were in such low amounts, it shouldn't have any effect. And the solvents that are used for the extraction are actually really volatile, so they have a really low boiling point, not boiling point, and also evaporation point. So if you cook it, they should evaporate anyway. I worked with the solvents, with the same solvents in the lab in, you know, liter amounts every day. So then actually all the chemists in the world would be more likely to get some health issues than, uh, you know, if you eat some soy chunks, you boil, uh, you know, in the sauce or, you know, do whatever heat processing. Oh, this is an amazing note because um, this I haven't seen mentioned anywhere. And uh, just people being afraid of it, you know. And actually, just today I received this question: like, what do I think about these highly processed, like uh, vegetable proteins and so on, because of the processing and, like you mentioned, because of the solvents. So thank you for bringing that down and basically answering that question. Yeah, and another interesting thing is the soy processing, and actually. I recently had to encounter myself <laughs> is um, that soy has also a high anti-nutrient amount. As I mentioned, anti-nutrients can uh, inhibit, oh, I'm really sorry for it. Uh, anti-nutrients can inhibit all kinds of digestive enzymes um, 
and um, you know then you can't digest protein properly and uh, soy if you heat process soy you destroy all the anti-nutrients for this reason it's always a good idea to buy heat processed soy flour if you you know cook with it or the textured uh, vegetable proteins or soy proteins that are used for fake meats and other stuff they are actually highly heat processed and this is beneficial because it destroys the anti-nutrient amount. It helps to digest protein better, and also anti-nutrients can cause all kinds of digestive issues like bloating. Um, I cook a lot with soy flour, and uh, here in Germany, the soy flour is properly heat processed that you can actually eat it raw and add it to the shape. And I was used to it, I never got any issues. And then at the beginning of the year when I was in Israel, I got a different brand of soy flour, and then I realized, oh, okay, if I eat the same amount of soy flour, I somehow start getting uh, digestive issues after eating soy flour. You know, what, what the hell happened? And then I remembered about this research. And actually, it happened uh, also to one of my clients, online coaching clients, uh, who lives in Africa. She made some soy cookies and tasted some of the dough raw, and then uh, she had terrible digestive issues for the next 24 hours. So also, like in this case, like heat processing and eating like this processed flowers, processed meats because they are like properly heated, properly roasted, it's a good thing because it destroys the anti-nutrients. That's amazing. Do you have this research saved somewhere so I can link it into the podcast show notes? Yeah. Yes, um, I need to double check it, but... Um, some of this research will be in my next book. I'm going to bring out my next recipe oh, book. Amazing. And it will be about soy and about uh, recipes with, uh, that are made with soy products, high protein recipes, and I will put a research product into it that explains also. There are also lots of myths about soy, like that men get soy boobs, uh, soy gives you cancer. So I, yeah, all kind of terrible stuff, and I address all the myths in this book. Now this is amazing because I haven't seen like this specifically being spoken about as much as just as you covered it right now. So this is amazing, and yeah, that, that was another question I got asked recently, like regarding the anti nutrients specifically in soy, but um, now we have it handled. I suppose this to some extent also applies to other legumes like beans and so on, but they don't have as high anti-nutrient content, am I right? Yeah, it applies to many uh, legumes, uh, these things with anti-nutrients. I don't have the numbers on top of my head that I can compare mm -hmm. the anti-nutrient content in different beans, although there are different types of anti-nutrients, right. which makes it also more difficult. So, you know, you would need to look up lots of research studies to make lots of really long tables to compare everything. Mm -hmm. But basically, um, based on my knowledge, it could be summed up like uh, the best, uh, let's say, bioavailability or the best forms of eating either legumes or grains would be to sprout them and then to heat them properly. So maybe use pressure cooker to... Yeah, them. sprout and cook. I wouldn't just sprout them without cooking. It, it's possible, but uh, sprouting definitely destroys some anti-nutrients. But also, like, when you sprout stuff, uh, there can be also different contaminations with different bacteria or, you know, whatever, depending on where it stands, how warm it is, what grows there, and, uh, you know, contaminations around in your kitchen. So... Uh, Definitely, you know, if you sprout it, I would, you can sprout it, cook it, and then it should be fine. Yeah, I mean, in combination. And also, we forget for good fermenting, like tempeh, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tempeh is also great, yeah. Yeah. So, th there are some questions that I could ask, and I would like to go through them. And okay. it's like, uh, what is your advice for people who, like look soft on a vegan diet so basically they go to gym they eat and you know they maybe are getting even some muscle but they still look like very soft like compared to when they were on like meat-based diet well they eat too much it's a matter about calories <laughs> you know if, if you start looking soft you eat too much 
that, yeah, that, probably. That, that, but but, but that, I but I also suppose be, sorry. Yeah, they should be more careful with the choice of uh, protein sources because let's say legumes, mm -hmm. uh, they have all the they have protein but also lots of carbs. Then just eat half the amount of legume seeds and add the additional protein using let's say pea protein. Like uh, you know, mixing it. Or also the same with nuts mm -hmm. and seeds. Okay, super. You ate lots of peanut butter. Yes, no wonder it made you look soft. Uh, <laughs> then have some of the half of the amount, quarter of the amount of peanut butter, and then you can actually get this um, defatted powdered peanut butter. Most people know it as PB2, or there are also lots of different brands out there. And you know, mix it in then, uh, or use it for baking or for you know, what, whatever you want. Put it into your oatmeal and uh, use it like this and there are also like i use defeated almond flour i use defeated sesame seed flour pumpkin seed flour sunflower seed flour so it's also all the protein from the seeds and nuts but the fat was squeezed out it's again as an example of positive processing like for me i want to maintain my body composition or you know lose weight for competition then i just take you know all the seeds on uh, nuts but just the defeated flour from them. And it's nothing bad about it because the flour was, uh, the fat was squeezed out for some kind of oil, almond oil, sunflower seed oil. And what stays there is uh, just a dry powder with higher protein content, higher fiber content, and nutrients. So, you know, what's the big deal about it? It's amazing because I, I, I think it comes down to also like macronutrient ratio to some extent. And definitely to the whole energy intake, um, in that case, like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So it's just you know, and, ma making smarter food choices. That's it. Yeah, definitely. And actually, I believe your book would be perfect for that kind of people. And also your protein pancakes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Protein pancake mix is amazing. It has like 30 grams protein per serving and just 20 gram carbs, just 3 grams fat. So, and it, 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 it's super convenient to make, you just add water to it and put it into a frying pan or a waffle iron, or you can make even crepe, like the three of the thin one, and then put lots of stuff in, roll it in, and eat them. So it's, it, it's really super convenient. So it's, even if you're busy, you have absolutely no excuse not to eat healthy and get what you need. Yeah, so, so it's like a very tasty protein powder <laughs> that, is, that can be used for many things. Well, you, you can't really make pancakes with a protein powder. Mm -hmm. You need to add some kind of starch source to it. And the problem with protein powder is that uh, often protein pancakes turn out too mushy. They don't have like a real, you know, fluffy, nice texture, which uh, the science baked protein uh, pancake mix has, I developed. So that's, that's great because this is like exactly food chemistry in practice. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Since I stopped doing experiments in the lab, I transport all my experiments to the kitchen. That's why I developed so many recipes, have recipe books, and now the uh, food products. Yeah, that's great. So I will make sure to link both your book and the protein pack product in the show notes. And then I. Perfect. Uh, my friend actually asked, like, I think it, it was on Instagram that you mentioned in one of your stories regarding. I don't know if it was like pull-ups or training in general. And uh, you asked like if it is good to train uh, and have this like muscle pain or, or something like this. And she asked or she didn't understand, my friend, that why you, sh yeah. why you should not train to the point of having like this muscle damage or uh, muscle pain. So could you explain this a little bit more? Okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Maybe first, um, all the soreness, muscle soreness is a genetic issue. And just to give you an example from my life, uh, I am I get sore if I overdo it. Upper body is fine. It recovers in one day. It, it, it's fine. I don't get like severely sore. But my quad gets sore as crazy. If I don't squat for a week and get back into squatting, I can just squat maybe my warm-up weight without getting sore. If I go back to more or less normal weight, I get so sore that I can't walk for half a week. Okay. Just 
from the training perspective, what do you think how good my training will be in the next week if I can't walk for half a week? And how motivated am I to go to the gym and train if I can't move? Exactly. That, that, that's the most obvious point. It's uh, like being like severely sore, it takes you all the motivation to train. And just by not training properly for half a week or a week, you just make less progress. Uh, also, your power output is not that good because, you know, you must have to adapt. Uh, you have to increase weight over time and really give your best in training to stimulate your muscle growth. If, if you are sore, you can't have the maximal training output. So it's better not to go, you know, totally crazy one day and not training properly for the entire week. It's better to go moderately crazy every time you are in the gym Mm-hmm. It's not getting sore. What is moderately crazy depends on the person and how likely you are to get sore and what muscle group it is. And it varies uh, completely among individuals. I, I had clients uh, who never got sore and they asked me for higher weight, higher volume, and I was like, yeah, are, are you really serious? Do you think you can handle it? And they could. But some people get sore really easily. Mm-hmm. And that's why it has to be. Uh, modulated and also muscle damage like when you get sore you damage your muscle uh, it's a sign that your body can't recover sufficiently and there is some there are some theories that muscle damage can contribute to muscle growth but most likely the more important factor is the time under tension so when you lift heavy loads and your muscle are under tension it's probably the most important factor and you should focus on this. And if you are sore, you can't focus on this anymore. <laughs> yeah, so to wrap it up or to sum it up, it, like uh, different people have different genetic predisposition to soreness. I would also say that the different people have different, um, let's say, feeling of soreness. So objectively, it could be 7 out of 10. Yeah. But for me personally, I can feel it like 10 out of 10 and other person like 5 out of 10 so this should be also considered and uh, that you feel yes it, it should be also considered and also like psychological factors some people don't mind pain or don't mind uh, to train when it's uh, you know when it hurts when it's heavy uh, I, i'm probably one of those people my uh, one of my very good friends i used to train with he watched me lifting and he mentioned, okay, it seems like you have a much higher pain tolerance pressure than other people. Exactly. Yeah, and th- th- that's true. that's why I often, I can't, you know, give the same training program to any to everybody. What I definitely don't do as a coach, but even also count for the intensity. So also with new clients, I usually, you know, ask, okay, how was your training? How did you tolerate it? You know, was it hard? Did you get sore? And so on and so on. So it's uh, something that has to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm exactly on that side that I can train to like muscle failure, for example, but I don't get sore. Sore. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, uh, so for you, if you don't get sore, it's kind of a good thing. But also training to muscle failure, especially for a man, isn't the best yeah. thing because it also lowers the testosterone levels, mm-hmm. which isn't good for muscle growth. Yeah, de- definitely not an advice or not that I would do it like every day or something. I'm just, uh, I was just comparing that I could go to the muscle fa- muscular failure when I couldn't push anymore, like my muscle would fail, but I, I wouldn't get sore. I mean, I would get a little bit sore, yeah. but nothing terrible. So that is like exactly yeah. the personal difference or kind of personal differences. Uh, so what kind of people do you actually work with if somebody would be interested in uh, working with you specifically or what could they learn from you? Yeah, okay. I learn, uh, I work with all kinds of people and uh, it's really my clients are a competitive athletes then but it's not only competitive athletes i love coaching uh, let's say normal people 
who want to get fit, who want to, you know, sort out their diet, who want to feel great in their body, who, you know, just don't know what to do. Then I also coach people who have problems with food, like recover from eating disorders or feel like they are too focused on food or food kind of, you know, determines about their lives or that they feel like a chronic dieter who are just dieting, dieting and can't lose weight. So even especially for people who have some, let's say, you know, emotional problems with food, I find working with them like even more, let's say, rewarding because you can really have an impact on people's lives and change their mindset and, you know, make them, you know, happy. And I believe that this is a very important topic. That's why I've been interested in it for past several weeks or months. And that is like uh, a lot of people live fitness. They want to look better. They want to feel better. But uh, a lot of people who are interested in food and fitness actually develop some kind of uh, eating disorder, I would say. Or, or, or they are the case of disordered eating. Unfortunately, we got cut out and for some reason there is like one or two minutes of the stream missing. But anyway, um, there was no discussion going on. What we mentioned in the last two minutes was how you can reach Anastasia and that is by going through her website, which is Science Strength, where you can find her, the way to contact her, you can reach her also through Instagram, which is also, once again, Science Strength. And on her website, you can also find her book and upcoming even cooking courses and coaching application. So if you would be interested in working with her, that's where you can find her. If you, would be, if you like this podcast, I will be very thankful to you for sharing it, liking it. And especially rating it as once again it helps me to promote it and promotion means that i can bring more extraordinary experts on different topics regarding health nutrition fitness and all things connected how to improve your life fitness energy and yeah so leave leave me a comment leave me a rating if you have any comments questions Well, you will find all the important links in the show notes. You have a great day.